circle of death circle of death hello welcome to mbd after the bible we are going to be doing the synopsis then we are going to be doing bedtime so yay have a good time Okay, we are in the book of Judges, not in Habakkuk. We are in Judges. Let me see if I can find it. Perfect. Okay. So, and I see that we have one viewer. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay. This is the book of Judges, chapter 7. And this is the English Standard Version of the Bible. Then Zerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Harad. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morach in the valley, or Mora, I don't know, in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set him by or set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, put their hands to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. And let all the others go, every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets. And he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance. And their camels were without number, and as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade, and he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped, and he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the three hundred men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me then blow the trumpets also on every side of, the, of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him 
came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried in his place around... Whoa, whoa. I held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah toward Zerah. Zerera as far as the border of Abel, Mohola, and Tabahath. Sorry, got distracted. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they captured the waters as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. And they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zaib. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zaib they killed at the winepress of Zaib. Then they pursued Midian and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zaib to Gideon across the Jordan. That is the end of chapter 7. So we'll read chapter 8 tomorrow. And now it is time for Kimberly to come and give us a synopsis of what we talked about yesterday. Kim? She is on her way. What happened in the last chapter, the last few chapters was um, they, the shepherds, they saw um, a very detailed description of um, the angels. A little more detailed than that, right? <laughs> yeah, like very detailed, like how they were all simple minded and everything and how they. The angels? No, no, no. The shepherds. Oh, the shepherds. Yeah. And how. When they saw the angels and heard that Jesus was born, they were like, you know what? Let's go do that. If God cares about us going over to see his son, then he'll take care of our flocks. And I bet he did. I bet he did. Yeah, I bet God did. Okay. You know, I actually think he did do that. I mean, when you think about it. And then um, they, found, they found Jesus in the manger in the cave. And then, um, and then the next chapter was um, the three kings trying to find Jesus. Oh, right. And, then, and, they, and they were like, and hey. They were, and they were like really kind of mean. Right? No. So they went up to the three kings and said, hey, there's the son of God over there. No, they were like, um, hey, I have think, you seen I think he? he might be like a king or something. No, nope, this is what they said. Oh, okay. Have you seen he who is born king of the Jews? Uh, no, they were like, uh, Bad. No? No. They eventually talked to this Roman guy, and he's like, Are you talking about Herod? And they're like, Nope. No way, no how. That explains in the early years, yes, Herod was sort of the ruler of the Jews at the time. Um, but he is not the king of the Jews. He was a king of the Jews. So, um, now we can start with chapter 13. All righty. I have a message. Let me just see what that is. Do, 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 do. 
Okay. All right. So um, hopefully somebody joins me, but if you don't, I understand because people have um, people watch it later. Um, I have seen lots of views after the fact, so that's fine. Um, chapter 13, the witnesses before Herod. That evening before sunset, some women were washing clothes on the upper step of the flight that led down into the basin of the pool of Siloam. They knelt each before a, bro a broad bowl of earthenware. A girl at the foot of the steps kept them supplied with water and sang while she filled the jar. The song was cheerful and no doubt lightened their labor. Occasionally, they would sit upon their heels and look up the slope of Othel and round, it, round to the summit of what is now the Mount of Offense, then faintly glorified by the dying sun. While they plied their hands, rubbing and wringing the clothes in the bowls, two other women came to them, each with an empty jar upon her shoulder. Peace to you, one of the newcomers said. The laborers paused, sat up, wrung the water from their hands, and returned the salutation. It is nearly night. Time to quit. There is no end to work, was the reply. But there is a time to rest and to hear what may be passing, interposed another. What news have you? Then you have not heard? No. They say the Christ is born, said the news newsmonger, plunging into her story. It was curious to see the faces of the laborers brighten with interest. On the other side, down came the jars, which in a moment were turned into seats for their owners. The Christ, the listeners cried. So they say, who? Everybody. It is common talk. Does anybody believe it? This afternoon, three men came across Brook Sidron on the road from Shechem, the speaker replied, circumstantially intending to smother doubt. Each one of them rode a camel, spotless white and larger than any ever before seen in Jerusalem. The eyes and mouths of the auditors opened wide. To prove how great and rich the men were, the narrator continued, they sat under awnings of silk, the buckles of their saddles were of gold, as was the fringe of their bridles. The bells were of silver and made real music. Nobody knew them. They looked as if they had come from the ends of the earth. Only one of them spoke, and of everybody on the road, even the women and children, he asked this question, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? No one gave them answer. No one understood what they meant, so they passed on, leaving behind them this saying, for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. They put the question to the Roman at the gate, and he, no wiser than the simple people on the road, sent them up to Herod. Where are they now? At the Khan? Hundreds have been, have been to look at them already, and hundreds more are going. Who are they? Nobody knows. They are said to be Persians. Wise men who talk with the stars, prophets it may be, like Elijah and Jeremiah. What do they mean by the king of the Jews, the Christ, and that he is just born? One of the women laughed and resumed her work, saying, Well, when I see him, I will believe. Another followed her example, and I, well, when I see him, raise the dead, I will believe. A third said quietly, he has been a long time promised. It will be enough for me to see him heal one leper. And the party sat talking until the night came and with the help of the frosty air drove them home. Later in the evening, about the beginning of the first watch, there was an assemblage at the palace on Mount Zion of probably 50 persons who never came together except by order of Herod, and then only when he had demanded to know someone or more of the deeper mysteries of the Jewish law and history. It was, in short, a meeting of the teachers of the colleges, of the chief priests, and of the doctors most noted in the city for learning, the leaders of opinions, founders of the different creeds, princes of the Sadducees, Pharisaic debaters, calm, soft-spoken, Stoical philosophers of the Essene socialists. 
the chamber in which the session was held belonged to one of the interior courtyards of the palace and was quite large and Romanesque. The floor was tessellated with marble blocks. The walls, unbroken by a window, were frescoed in panels of saffron yellow. A divan occupied the center of the apartment, covered with cushions of bright yellow cloth and fashioned in form of the letter U, the opening towards the doorway in the arch of the divan, or as it were in the bend of the letter, there was an immense bronze tripod, curiously inlaid with gold and silver over which a chandelier dropped from the ceiling, having seven arms, each holding a lighted lamp. The divan and the lamp were purely Jewish. The company sat upon the divan after the style of the Orientals in costume singularly uniform except as to color. They were mostly men advanced in years. Immense beards covered their faces. To their large noses were added the effects of large black eyes, deeply shaded by bold brows. Their demeanor was grave, dignified, even patriarchal. In brief, their session was that of the Sanhedrin. He who sat before the tripod, however, in the place which may be called the head of the divan, having all the rest of his associates on his right and left, and at the same time before him evidently president of the meeting, would have instantly absorbed the attention of a spectator. He had been cast in large mold, but was now shrunken and stooped to ghastliness. His white robe dropped from his shoulders in folds and gave no hint of muscle or anything but an angular skeleton. His hands, half concealed by sleeves, sleeves of silk, white and crimson striped, were clasped upon his knees. When he spoke, sometimes the first finger of the right hand extended tremulously. He seemed incapable of other gesture, uh, but his head was a splendid dome. A few hairs, whiter than fine-drawn silver, fringed the base over a broad, full-sphered skull. The skin was drawn close and shone in the light with positive brilliance. The temples were deep hollows from which the forehead beetled like a wrinkled crag. The eyes were wan and dim, the nose was pinched, and all the lower face was muffled in a beard flowing and venerable as Aaron's. Such was Hillel the Babylonian, the line of prophets, long extinct in Israel, was now succeeded by a line of scholars of whom he was first in learning, a prophet in all but the divine inspiration. At the age of 106, he was still rector of the great college. From the table before him lay outspread a roll or volume of parchment inscribed with Hebrew characters. Behind him, in waiting, excuse me, Be behind him, in waiting, stood a page richly habited. Sorry. Um, there had been discussion, but at this moment of introduction, the company had reached a conclusion. Each one was an attitude of rest, and the venerable Hillel, without moving, called the page, Hist! The youth advanced respectfully. Go tell the king we are ready to give him answer. The boy hurried away. After a time, two officers entered and stopped, one on each side of the door. After them, slowly, followed a most striking personage, an old man clad in a purple robe bordered with scarlet and girt to his waist by a band of gold linked so fine that it was pliable as leather. The latchets of his shoes sparkled with precious stones. A narrow crown wrought in filigree shone outside a tarbouche of soft crimson plush, which, encasing his head, fell down the neck and shoulders, leaving the throat and neck exposed. Instead of a seal, a dagger dangled from his belt. He walked with a halting step, leaning heavily upon the staff. Not until he reached the opening of the divan did he pause to look up from the floor. Then, as for the first time conscious of the company and roused by their presence, he raised himself and looked haughtily around like one startled 
in searching for an enemy so dark, suspicious, and threatening was the glance. Such was Herod the Great, a body broken by disease, a conscience seared with crimes, a mind magnificently capable, a soul fit for brotherhood with Caesar's, now seven and sixty years old, but guarding his throne with a jealousy never so vigilant, a power never so despotic, and a cruelty never so inexorable. There was a general movement on the part of the assemblage, a, blending for, a bending forward in Salam by the more aged, a rising up by the more courtier, courtierly, followed by low genuflections, whatever that is, hands upon the beard or breast. His observation taken, Herod moved on until at the tripod opposite the venerable Hillel, who met his cold glance with an inclination of the head, and a slight lifting of the hands. The answer, said the king, with imperious simplicity, addressing Hillel and planting his staff before him with both hands. The answer! The eyes of the patriarch glowed mildly, and raising his head and looking the inquisitor full in the face, he answered his associates, giving him closest attention. With thee, O king, be the peace of God, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His manner was that of invocation. Changing it, he resumed, Thou hast demanded of us where the Christ should be born. The king bowed, though his evil eyes remained fixed upon the sage's face. That is the question. Then, O king, speaking for myself and all my brethren here, not one dissenting, I say, in Bethlehem of Judea, Hillel glanced at the parchment on the tripod and, pointing with his tremulous finger, continued, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Herod's face was troubled, and his eyes fell upon the parchment while he thought. Those beholding him scarcely breathed. They spoke not, nor did he. At length, he turned about and left the chamber. Brethren, said Hillel, we are dismissed. The company then arose and in groups departed. Simeon, said Hillel again, a man quite fifty years old, but in the hearty prime of life, answered and came to him. Take up the parchment, my son. Roll it tenderly. The order was obeyed. Now lend me thy arm, I will to the litter. The strong man stooped with his withered hands. The old man took the offered support and, rising, moved feebly to the door. So the departed, the famous rector, and Simeon, his son, who was to be his successor in wisdom, learning, and office. Yet later in the evening, the wise men were lying in a lewin of the Khan awake. The stones which served them as pillows raised their heads so they could look out of the open porch into the depths of the sky, and as they watched the twinkling of the stars, they thought of the next manifestation. How would it come? What would it be? They were in Jerusalem at last. They had asked at the gate for him. They sought. They had borne witness of his birth. It remained only to find him. And as to that, they placed all trust in the Spirit. Men listening for the voice of God, or waiting a sign from heaven, cannot sleep. While they were in this condition, a man stepped in under the arch, darkening the lewin. Awake, he said to them, I bring you a message which will not be put off. They all sat up. From whom? asked the Egyptian. Herod the king. Each one felt his spirit thrill. Are you not the steward of the Khan? Balthazar asked next. I am. What would the king with us? His messenger is without. Let him answer. Tell him then to abide our coming. You were right, O oh my brother, said the Greek, when the steward was gone. The question put to the people on the road and to the guard at the gate has given us quick 
notoriety. I am impatient. Let us up quickly. They arose, put on their sandals, girt their mantles about them, and went out. I salute you and give you peace and pray your pardon. But my master, the king, has sent me to invite you to the palace, where he would have speech with you privately. Thus the messenger discharged his duty. A lamp hung in the entrance, and by its light they looked at each other and knew the spirit was upon them. Then the Egyptian stepped to the steward and said, so as not to be heard by the others, you know where our goods are stored in the court and where our camels are resting. While we are gone, make all things ready for our departure, if it should be needful. Go your way, assured, trust me, the steward replied. The king's will is our will, said Balthazar to the messenger. We will follow you. The streets of the, of the holy city were narrow then as now, but not so rough and foul, for the great builder, not content with beauty, enforced cleanliness and convenience also. Following their guide, the brethren proceeded without a word through the dim starlight made dimmer by the walls on both sides, sometimes almost lost under bridges connecting the housetops. Out of a low ground, they ascended a hill. At last, they came to a portal reared across the way in the light of fires blazing before it in two great braziers. They caught a glimpse of the structure and also of some guards leaning motionlessly upon their arms. They passed into a building unchallenged, then by passages and arched halls through courts and under colonnades, not always lighted up long flights of stairs, past innumerable cloisters and cloisters, excuse me, and chambers, they were conducted into a tower of great height. Suddenly, the guide halted and, pointing through an open door, said to them, Enter. The king is there. The air of the chamber was heavy with the perfume of sandalwood, and all the appointments within were effeminately rich. Upon the floor, covering the central space, a twisted rug was spread, and upon a throne was set. The visitors had but time, however, to catch a confused idea of the palace, of carved and gilt ottomans and couches, of fans and jars and musical instruments, of golden candlesticks glittering in their own lights, of walls painted in the style of the voluptuous Grecian school, one look at which had made a Pharisee hide his head with holy horror. Herod, sitting upon the throne to receive them, clad as when at the conference with the doctors and the lawyers claimed all their minds. At the edge of the rug, to which they advanced uninvited, they prostrated themselves. The king touched a bell. An attendant came in and placed three stools before the throne. Seat yourselves, said the monarch graciously. From the north gate, he continued, when they were at rest, I had this afternoon report of the arrival of three strangers curiously mounted and appearing as if from far countries. Are you the men? The Egyptian took the sign from the Greek and the Hindu and answered with the profoundest salam. We, or were we other than we are, the mighty Herod, whose fame is an incense to the whole world, would not have sent for us. We may not doubt that we are the strangers. That meant yes. Herod acknowledged the speech with a wave of the hand. Who are you? Whence do you come? He asked, adding significantly, let each speak for himself. In turn, they gave him account, referring simply to the cities and lands of their birth and the routes by which they came to Jerusalem. Somewhat disappointed, Herod plied them for more, them more directly. What was the question you put to the officer at the gate? We asked him, where is he that is born king of the Jews? I see now why the people were so curious. You excite me no less. Is there another king of the Jews? The Egyptian did not blanch. There is one newly born. An expression of pain 
knit the dark face of the monarch as if his mind were swept by a harrowing recollection. Not to me, not to me, he exclaimed. Possibly the accusing images of his murdered children flitted before him, recovering from the emotion, whatever it was, he asked steadily, where is this new king? That, O oh king, is what we would ask. You bring me a wonder, a riddle surpassing any, Solo any of Solomon's, the inquisitor said next. As you see, I am in the time of life when curiosity is as ungovernable as it was in childhood, when to trifle with it is cruelty. Tell me further, and I will honor you as kings honor each other. Give me all you know about the newly born, and I will join in the search for him. And when we have found him, I will do what you wish. I will bring him to Jerusalem and train him in kingcraft. I will use my grace with Caesar for his promotion and glory. Jealousy shall not come between us, so I swear. But tell me first how, so widely separated by seas and deserts, you all came to hear of him. I will tell you truly, O king, speak on, said Herod. Balthazar raised himself erect and said solemnly, There is an almighty God. Herod was visibly startled. He bade us come hither, promising that we should find the Redeemer of the world, that we should see and worship him, and bear witness that he was come. And, as a sign, we were each given to see a star. His spirit stayed with us. O king, his spirit is with us now. An overpowering feeling seized the three. The Greek, with difficulty, restrained an outcry. Herod's gaze darted quickly from one to the other. He was more suspicious and dissatisfied than before. You are mocking me, he said. If not, tell me more. What is to follow the coming of the new king? The salvation of men. From what? From their wickedness. How? By the divine agencies. Faith, love, and good works. Then, Herod paused, and from his look no man could have said with what feeling he continued. You are the heralds of the Christ. Is that all? Balthazar bowed low. We are your servants, O king. The monarch touched a bell, and the attendant appeared. Bring the gifts, the master said. The attendant went out, but in a little while returned, and, kneeling before the guests, gave to each one an outer robe or mantle of scarlet and blue and a girdle of gold. They acknowledged the honors with eastern prostinations. A word further, said Herod, when the ceremony was ended. To the officer of the gate, and but now to me, you spoke of seeing a star in the east. Yes, said Balthazar, his star. The star of the newly born. What time did it appear? When we were bidden come hither. Herod rose, signifying the audience was over. Stepping from the throne towards him, he said with all graciousness, If, as I believe, O illustrious men, you are indeed the heralds of the Christ just born, now I know, or know that I have this night consulted those wisest in things Jewish, and they say with one voice he should be born in Bethlehem of Judea. I say to you, go thither, go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. To your going there shall be no let or hindrance. Peace be with you. And folding his robe about him, he left the chamber. Directly the guide came and led them back to the street and thence to the Khan at the portal of which the Greek said impulsively, Let us to Bethlehem, O brethren, as the king has advised. Yes, cried the Hindu, the spirit burns within me. Be it so, said Balthazar with equal warmth, the camels are ready. They gave gifts to the steward, mounted into their saddles, and received directions to the Joppa gate and departed.
at their approach the great valves were unbarred and their path and they passed out into the open country taking the roads so lately traveled by joseph and mary and they came up out of him Hinnom, on the plain of rephaim a light appeared or as they came a light appeared at first white spread and faint their pulses fluttered fast the light intensified rapidly they closed their eyes against its burning brilliance when they dared look again lo the star perfect as any in the heavens but low down and moving slowly before them and they folded their hands and shouted and rejoiced with exceedingly great joy god is with us god is with us they repeated in frequent cheer all the way until the star rising out of the valley beyond mar elias stood still over a house upon the slope of the hill near the town chapter 14 the wise men find the child it was now the beginning of the third watch and at bethlehem in the morning was breaking or the morning was breaking over the mountains in the east but so feebly that it was yet night in the valley the watchman on the roof of the old khan shivering in the chilly air was listening for the first distinguishable sounds with which life awakening greets the dawn when a light came moving up the hill towards the house he thought it a torch in someone's hand next moment he thought it a meteor the brilliance grew however until it became a star sore afraid he cried out and brought everybody within the walls to the roof the phenomenon its in eccentric motion continued to approach the rocks trees and roadway under it shone as in a glare of lightning directly its brightness became bl blinding the more timid of the beholders fell upon their knees and prayed with their faces hidden the boldest covering their eyes crouched and now and then snatched glances fearfully after a while the khan and everything thereabout lay under the intolerable radiance such as dared look beheld the star standing still directly over the house in front of the cave where the child had been born in the height of this scene the wise men came up and at the gate dismounted from their camels and shouted for admission when the steward was so far mastered his terror as to give them heed he drew the bars and opened to them the camels looked spectral in the unnatural light and besides their outlandishness there were in their faces and manner of three visitors an eagerness and exaltation which still further excited the keeper's fears and fancy he fell back and for a time could not answer the question they put to him is this not bethlehem of judea but others came and by their presence gave him assurance no this is but the khan the town lies further on is there not here a child newly born the bystanders turned to each other marveling though some of them answered yes yes show us to him said the greek impatiently show us to him cried balthazar breaking through his gravity for we have seen his star even that which ye behold over the house and are come to worship him the hindu clasped his hands exclaiming god indeed lives make haste make haste the savior is found blessed blessed are we above men the people from the roof came down and followed the strangers as they were taken through the court and out into the enclosure at sight of the star yet above the cave though less candescent than before some turned back afraid the greater part went on as the strangers neared the house the orb arose when they were at the door it went out lost to sight and to the witnesses of that of what then took place came a conviction that there was a divine relation between the star and the strangers which extended also to at least some of the occupants of the cave when the door was opened they crowded in the apartment was lighted by a lantern enough to enable the strangers to find the mother and the child awake in her lap 
Yes, Kimberly. What what's going on? Yeah, well, it's because our dogs aren't bark barking, okay? I don't know. Okay, I've got a page left. Can I finish? Okay, good. Um, to the witnesses of what then took place came a conviction that there was a divine relation between the star and the strangers, which extended also to at least some of the occupants of the cave. When the door was opened, they crowded in. The apartment was lighted by a lantern enough to enable the strangers to find the mother and the child awake in her lap. Is the child thine? asked Balthazar of Mary. And she, who had kept all the things in the least affecting the little one and pondered them in her heart, held it up in the light, saying, He is my son. And they fell down and worshipped him. And they saw the child was as other children, about its head was neither nimbus nor material crown. Its lips opened not in speech. If it heard their expressions of joy, their invocations, their prayers, it made no sign whatever, but baby light looked longer at the flame in the lantern than at them. In a little while, they arose and returning to the camels, brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and laid them before the child, abating nothing of their worshipful speeches, of which no part is given, for the thoughtful know that the pure worship of the heart was then what it is now, and has always been an inspired song. And this was the Savior they had come so far to find, yet they worshipped without a doubt. Why? Their faith rested upon the sign sent them by him whom we have since come to know as the Father, and they were of the kind of whom his promises were so all-sufficient that they asked nothing about his ways. Few there were who had seen the signs and heard the promises, the mother and Joseph, the shepherds and the three. Yet they all believed alike, that is to say, in this period of the plan of salvation, God was all, and the child nothing. But look forward, O reader, a time will come when the signs will all proceed from the Son. Happy they who then believe in him. Let us wait that period. That is the end of book one. I'm not sure what he's saying about the Christology of Jesus right there. Um, so uh, we'll just leave that to uh, literary license and... Um, we'll just continue with book two tomorrow. The next chapter, by the way, is called chapter one, Jerusalem under the Romans. So, all right. Oh, and the first word, it. And I will just give you a clue. 21 years pass before it the next. Is. It is. Oh, oh first yep. JJ got the second word also. Wow, really giving away the plot there. All right, so I hope I hope that everybody has a good night and I will see you again later. And call have a good night. We'll see you. Night. Bye.